I'm Brett from Heinemann. Today in the podcast, we have an excerpt from our new Forward Ed Slow Conference series. Today's conversation features Irene Fountas, Gay Sue Pinnell, and Cornelius Minor. Irene Fountas is the Marie M. Clay Endowed Chair for Early Literacy and Reading Recovery at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Director of the Center for Reading Recovery and Literacy Collaborative in the Graduate School of Education. She has been a classroom teacher, language arts specialist, and consultant in school districts across the nation and abroad. Gay Sue Pinnell is Professor Emerita in the School of Teaching and Learning at The Ohio State University and a member of the Reading Hall of Fame. She has extensive experience in classroom teaching, field-based research, and in developing comprehensive literacy systems. Cornelius Minor is a Brooklyn-based educator. He works with teachers, school leaders, and leaders of community-based organizations to support equity literacy reform. He is the author of We Got This, Equity, Access, and the Quest to Be Who Our Students Need Us to Be. Together, these authors discuss their vision and values around literacy instruction, providing encouragement to teachers and school leaders to always keep students at the center of their planning, teaching, and decision-making. This conversation is part of Heinemann's new video series, Forward Ed, Forward Together in Education. If you would like to watch the full videos of this and other conversations in the Forward Ed series, you can find them on the Heinemann Publishing Facebook page or YouTube channel. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking about as I think about this moment too is like you all have always been kind of the folks that I turn to when I'm thinking about how to make sense of a moment. Like what feels really important to you in terms of reading right now? Uh, Simplistic solutions to complex issues. Meaning, (laughs) you know, there is such a drive to, you know, come up with one answer, one solution and lose the complexity of educational systems, particularly for black and brown children, for poor children, uh, children of poverty, uh, so that we have schools that often shift to blame the children (laughs) instead of look at the educational system and the results of what we're doing. (laughs) You know, I hope Gay and I can make more of a mark in in that agenda. Uh, we're, We're really trying and Our most recent work and thinking is very much targeted at school leaders uh, because we're learning that the school leader's response, even in the example that you gave today, is precisely where much of the challenge is because well-intended school leaders who are trying to implement with fidelity, that's another word I just think is a challenging one, (laughs) uh, are losing the complexity of the fact that children learn as individuals and we are collectively responsible for the individuals who arrive at our door. And that means complex approaches to literacy learning and everything else. And looking at literacy in a broader lens, literacy Mm -hmm. in science and social studies and how kids are using literacy in their lives. So this you know, we're going to give you a script, we're going to give you a program, it's going to be the answer to everything, is a waste of money, resources, and in fact, insulting to teachers. <laughs> so we're, we're working, we're, we're really targeting our work now to work more with administrators, coaches, um, people who take a leadership role in supporting teacher development. Gay, do you want to say more about that? And then we got questions for you, Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, what I was I was going to ask is, you have painted a, a picture of how you came in as an into education as a teacher as a very young beginning teacher. How did you begin to develop the values and and the vision that you have today? Can you say anything about that that journey? Absolutely. I think, um, and and this is a word that I use often, but in many ways, it was like love. Like I watched kids falling in love with books and I watched how that happened organically. And I watched how that happened in connection to their friends and in connection to their families and in connection to their experiences. And, and so, and, and every time I saw it happen, every time I saw a kid love a book, I just made the mental note. This is not how the curriculum told me that it would go, right? This is not how the script told me that it would go. And so 
after a while, I was like, I think I have enough schema as a teacher to cultivate the kind of love that I want to see in a reading classroom in ways that matter to kids. Like, and, and I remember the first time that I stepped away from a script that had been handed to me, there was a bodega across the street. Um, I'm in New York City. Um, so there was a bodega across the street with a very popular bodega owner. And if you're not in New York City, bodega is a small corner store and everybody goes to the small corner store in, in the morning. So you are on a first name basis with the person that runs the corner store. And the guy that ran the corner store knew all of the sports scores. I was a few blocks away from Yankee Stadium and he would know all of the sports scores from memory. He would just like read the paper and he internalized the whole sports page. And so you would walk in and he could quote the sports page and I would watch kids in awe of him kids would be like, how did he do that? And I'm like, well, he did that by reading this sports page. And he did that by looking at this magazine or by checking this stat sheet. And kids would be like, well, I want to do that. And I'm like, wait, this desire to read and to understand and to synthesize data didn't come from some esoteric intellectual place. It came from somebody in the community that they love. Right. And, and so for me, like really in that moment, understanding that this man who runs the corner store is an educator, that he is the inspiration behind kids drive to read informational texts in my classroom, you know? And so once I put that together, I'm like, well, what else in this community can be an educator? What else in the community can I use to inspire, you know, kids to move toward informational texts or kids to move toward fantasy? Um, and so really it was that experimentation. And that's why I'm so glad to hear you all advocate for that, that, that I think so many times, especially in toxic school environments and in toxic school communities, people have this expectations that teachers are going to be perfect, that this teacher is going to go try this thing. And then automatically this kid is going to become a proficient reader. And one of the things that I learned early is that's not how it goes, that my first few years were a series of trial, error, data collection, trial, error, data collection, trial, error, data collection. And so that idea of action research has been everything for me. Like, how do I try something watch the kids, watch how they respond to it, watch how they grow, watch how they talk about it, refine what I'm doing, and then try that thing again. You know, that that has been the most radical thing in my professional growth, that that freedom to make intellectual decisions about the direction that my class is going to move in. And that's been big for me. Um, and, you know, and Irene, when you talk about you know, what has happened recently in this last decade about this idea of equity, that's where it came from that like my, so much of my work stands on your shoulders. Like this idea that, okay, I learned from these two that if something isn't working in reading, I can examine the kids, I can examine the thing, I can reconstruct the thing and try it again and see if it works better. And so that's how reading had worked for me. And so I was like, well, what about the school community at large? What if there's something in the school community that's not working for girls? What if there's something in the school community that's not working for black and brown children or queer children or poor children? Just like I did with reading, I can examine the thing in the community that's not working for the kids. I can research the kids. I can reinvent the thing and see if it works better. And so that cycle of trial and data collection has served me in every aspect of the work from, from reading to, to equity, like it served me in every aspect of the work. And so when I think about, you know, I, I think all the time about the incredible gift that the two of you have given this profession. And I ask myself often, like, what is the gift that I want to give this profession? And, and that's what it is. It's that ability to, to really make decisions that are best for children and that we make those decisions by researching children. And research doesn't have to be, you know, I go and do a book length study. Research can be, let me sit next to this kid today and talk to them about the choices that they're making in their book. Let me sit next to this kid and talk to them about how they feel about this character. Let me sit next to this kid and talk to them about how they feel about this vowel blend, right? You know, all of those, that's research. And, and that, that idea that I can observe and act and observe again and act has been an incredibly liberating one for me. And so that's where, you know, that's how kind of I went from, you know, that Cornelius to this one right now. And I think I'm still growing. What's coming through to me from this is that you really value what children bring to the process. I hate this, just always looking for something wrong with the child and okay, now that now we know what it is. It's you're placing a true value on what the individual brings to the process, think their thinking, their perspectives, 
what interests them, what they value, and the strengths could even be what they know, currently know about letters and sounds and need to know next. But it's that teacher ability to do that kind of, um, I had a friend who used to call it scientific teaching. And what she really meant was exactly what you said is you're doing your own research and you're learning from your teaching and take it to the leadership level. Same thing. You can learn from what you do so that every year, everybody ought to get a little bit better at what we do. And it's exciting. You know, I think one of the, I think about longevity and what it means to turn a job into a career. And for me, it's that curiosity. It's like, okay, here's what I did last time I did fantasy with kids. Let's see what I can add to it to make it a little bit different, a little bit more powerful. Or here's what I did last time I blended vowels with kids. Um, and here were the outcomes that last time. And because I want better outcomes this next time, here's how I might do it differently. Like all of those, those are the questions that sustain me. Like, you know, when, when people ask Cornelius, why are you still here? It's that curiosity <laughs> that's, you know, that like that, oh, well, I think if I do it one more time, I can get this like new result if I try it this other way. Um, and so that's been really exciting for me. And then, and then the idea too, of just allowing kids to bring all of their discoveries with them. One of my favorite things to do is to talk to kids about like, you know, what they think letters can do or what they think, you know, sounds can do. And then like trying on different, you know, like trying on different letters and sounds and be like, oh gosh, you come with this great understanding of the letter Q. And so here's all this really cool stuff that we get to do now that you've come with this like really beautiful understanding where you have these really big questions about what that U is doing after the letter Q. And so now we can explore all these words and like, and, and like have fun with these big questions. That's again, where my joy comes from is just like watching kids be like, okay, I have this idea about a book, about a character. I have this idea about myself as a reader. Like, what do you think, Mr. Minor? Could we try this? You know, those are the fun things. So there. Cornelius, I've been thinking as you were talking that you are implied in what you're saying is that you, the teacher, and of course, other teachers would need to have strong content knowledge about texts and genre and alphabetic system uh, so that your decisions that honor where children are and keep them uh, with a sense of agency and drive about their learning is also moving in a direction because you have a roadmap <laughs> Mm -hmm. of where it is you want to take them. Because I think mm -hmm. there is this tension between what students can do mm -hmm. and what they need to be able to, to know and be able to do to be competent in the world. And, you know, that's a reality that we face in schools. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know you, you do a lot of work with the middle school kids and what you're seeing is in many ways the results of the elementary system, <laughs> meaning the children arrived in the middle school, and this is what they know and can do. And the role of the middle school teachers is to take them from there. One of the things that has troubled me uh, in elementary schools is this quick move to departmentalized programs uh, as early as they can to, quote, get them ready for middle school. And I'm mm -hmm. sitting here thinking that you have I don't know, 25 students for, I don't know how long a period is in your middle school, but I'm guessing it's minutes, under an yeah. hour. Yeah. <laughs> and you have these 25 individual kids with all of this interest in intellectual curiosity and different needs. And one teacher in the room who's mm -hmm. going to get to know 25 kids and make decisions for each of them mm -hmm. to bring them forward in a few hours a day. <laughs> 180 days in a year and it's it's this meet them where they are and take them as far as you can take them and you can't do any of it if you don't know them well and when we look at middle school teachers who see maybe 150 different kids in a day how well can you get to know 150 kids where the elementary teacher might need to get to know 25 or 30 so this shift from our vision of what can happen in elementary schools and the reality of what happens in the middle school, I think is a challenge for the educational system. I would be holding off departmentalization as long as I could uh, mm -hmm. in order to know the whole child and mm -hmm. to be able to make those kinds of decisions that are mm -hmm. supportive to the child, to the whole child. 
I mean, that's huge. Like so much of what I have learned hasn't just been I pronoun. It's been we, you know, I am, you know, I make no secret about like, you know, the team at Sunset Park Prep, which is, you know, my favorite middle school on the planet. Um, you know, I'm here in Brooklyn, so shout out to Brooklyn, but the team at Sunset Park Prep, um, I've been there for over a decade now. And that group of teachers has taught me more than anything I've learned in life, right? Because we we think about the kids together, we plan for the kids together, sometimes we argue together, but like, but that idea that, yeah, we see kids for 50 minute chunks. And so what the math teacher learns about a particular kid that's gonna see me later on in the day is important for me to know. And so we share that data across like teams. Um, And one of the things that has been really powerful, and I love how you talked about teacher content knowledge, we also have had to share our professional learning together, that if I learn a thing about how a kid can practice reading a text, then I take what I learn about practice and I might share it with the social studies teacher so that they can think about how they might repurpose and apply that to practice. You know, if I learn a thing about decoding words, I might share that with the science teacher because kids are going to run into the same decoding issues in science. And so I love your idea there of, yeah, like teacher learning is really, really important. And I think we exist in an ecosystem right now where people want to take shortcuts around teacher learning. And so there are school leaders who will say, instead of cultivating teacher learning and instead of building time for teacher learning, I'm just going to give my teachers the script to follow. Um, And I think, again, having, you know, Jen, the principal at Sunset Park Prep, create time for us to learn and to study together has made it where we can make decisions you know, in the moment, we can make decisions the week before we can make decisions after we have like had an experience with children that all benefit kids. And so we don't have to rely on Jen to hand us things because she's given us the time for us to study and learn together so that we can make decisions. And so I think that that's a really important point. When we think about the way forward for the profession, the way forward cannot be scripted. The way forward cannot be teacher-proofed. Rather, the way forward must be like reflection, thinking, planning, execution, then reflection again, planning, thinking. You know, I think especially now as we recover from this pandemic, right, that we're all coming back in these different ways. Um, I haven't been in a physical classroom in months, it's kind of interesting. Like my friends and I were talking the other night. I don't even know if I still got it. Right. You know, like I'm zoom life now. And so like really, but, but then that too is a process of study. So we're all studying together right now to really think about, all right, we've been on zoom for 18 months. Now we're headed back this fall. Let's think about how that's going to go. Let's think about that transition. And so again, all of that for me, I feel like I've gotten it from you all. You all have really, and your work has really just freed me to say, I can try a thing. I can study the impact that that thing has on children and community. I can refine the thing and try it again. That's just been so valuable for me. You know, Cornelius, you're you're describing a culture of collaboration and teacher growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what you're saying is that you are all both learning from each other, but also taking collective ownership for the student outcomes. Uh, And that doesn't exist in a lot of schools. And I think teachers don't always aren't always um, looked to uh, with that kind of, and I I think the word is respect. I mean, my greatest respect is with the teachers who are working with the children in front of them every day and not second guessing, but rather asking the teacher why they made the decisions they made so I can get behind the teacher's thinking. And I think if we as school leaders or coaches or anyone who has a role in school improvement could get behind teachers thinking, getting behind school leaders thinking, because it's getting back to the rationales that will lead us to good decisions for children and good decisions for schools. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, especially now in this impulsive moment, right? Everybody is response, 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 response. Um, and I just love your call. Like we can actually take the time to think. Time, time is time is the most valuable commodity. <laughs> I know. Mm-hmm. And it's very scarce in schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and the kind of collaboration you're talking about in itself takes time. And it best if it's part, it's just seen as part of my job. Um, mm-hmm. and we don't talk about my children and your children and the first grade teacher's children. It, it, every kid who enters that school 
is our children and um, taking the time to communicate in that mm-hmm. way, both to colleagues and to kids is mm-hmm. really important. So it's that's culture, that's community. And you know, it's so like cosmic just to be having this moment to sit with the two of you because you all have been in my life for 20 years now, you know, for the last two decades that I read you all as a young student, you know, and I hesitate to use this word at risk of like blushing, but like I fell in love. Like your work was so like, it's so powerfully transformative to me, you know, like I'm a reading teacher and and you all are heroes in that world for me that like, I think about your work and how you all like, you know, you, 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 you reference Mari Clay and you all built this understanding in me that literacy is of course like letter sounds and phonemes and blends and diphthongs, but then also you all helped me to learn very early in my career that literacy is also love and community and building trust and watching children. And so I was able to step into my career with all of this rich understanding. But the thing that was really difficult for me as a young teacher was that I stepped into this profession and my very first principal handed me a stack of scripts that he called a curriculum. And then he asked me to like level all these books. And then a kid can only go to this side of the library if they've reached this level. And I remember kind of feeling this incredible tension where I'm like, no, I, I, I've read about reading. And I know that reading is watching kids and understanding them. And I know that reading is helping kids to like master letter sounds, you know, in ways that are developmentally appropriate to them. I'm not sure about this script. I'm not sure about these like strict levels and ranking kids. And so my first question for this evening is like, how do you all deal with the reality that you all have done such beautiful and powerful and transformative work, but then some people interpret and enforce that work in such toxic ways? I I think this, um, Cornelius, you've put your finger on a a real problem and one that is uh, pretty distressing to us the leveling of books has to do with the characteristics of the texts and what might be appropriate for a child to read with just a little bit more challenge so that instruction is powerful. It is a teacher tool. And nowhere ever did we imagine that children would be choosing their own reading books by level. It was something that helped a teacher get in the right ballpark to provide children with, a, 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 with books in instruction for a small amount of time per day, maybe 20 minutes, to teach with precision and power. It's a teacher tool. We don't even put level books in the classroom where children can get to them. The teacher will bring in a book from the closet or a high shelf and say, I've, I've selected a book for you to read, for us to read as a group today. But there's another time that's incredibly and equally important when children choose their own books and they always have a book they're reading and they don't choose the book by level. They choose it by what's interesting to me, what feels right when I read it. I like nonfiction. They they have favorites, favorite genres, favorite authors. They get on a dinosaur tear. Yeah, um, I, I would just add to that that People who really understand what a level means understand that there is a composite of text characteristics, 10 different characteristics that have to do with elements of the text, its genre, its form, uh, and so on, to understand that those characteristics were taken into account so that the teacher uh, uses them with intention with um, specific children at a specific point in time, when those books will fully engage children's thinking and humor and allow them to be successful in expanding their competencies. And that's only one small bit of an approach to literacy teaching that includes read aloud and shared reading and choice reading and book clubs where kids talk. And and in your question, Cornelius, you raised um, in the very beginning before you, you know, moved on to raise the issue of level text, 
you really talked about joy. And for us, you know, literacy is a human right. And we take children as they arrive. <laughs> you know, these are the children uh, with all of their interests and life experiences and languages and hopes and dreams. And for us, we advocate what we've referred to as a multi-text approach to literacy learning, which means that children engage with all different kinds of texts for different purposes. And we would never take a book out of a child's hand, even if it was a kindergartner with Harry Potter in her hand. <laughs> um, we would thoughtfully think about why that child is holding that book. You know, maybe someone read part of it to her and she just wants to hold it for a while and mm -hmm. turn the pages. Now, of course, we also know our responsibility as teachers and Gay used a very important word in guiding children in ways that will serve them well and not take away the joy. So taking children as they arrive means for us, and certainly the root of Mari Clay's work, was observation, systematic observation of children's um, language, their writing, their hopes, their dreams, knowing the child. And child-centered teaching is very important to us because it means that the teacher who knows the child well will teach the child best. Um, you also did raise, use the word scripts. And I think we should talk about scripts, Gay, a little bit and Cornelius, um, because there are scripts and there is guidance for teachers. <laughs> and what we learned early on is that teachers who had not engaged in authentic literacy teaching with children were doing things like relying on um, workbooks and work papers and using novels and having kids answer questions after every chapter. And we found that teachers wanted more support in knowing what a book club would feel like and sound like, some guidance to get the kids started, some ways of introducing a leveled book to a group that would give children a good frame for what they were going to read, or an example of how to engage in interactive read aloud in a way that really promoted children's thinking in meaningful ways. So we, over our career, uh, we've not only been involved in developing what we think are beautiful complex texts, but we've also worked, um, in fact, it takes years to develop level texts that reflect the kind of control that would allow children to make progress over time by having books that are tailored to their learning at a particular moment. But all of these in the hands of teachers who have had professional learning opportunities. So much of what happens in education is a misinterpretation of intent, teachers doing the best they can with what they have, and even administrators who have good intent, thinking that if we put leveled books in baskets and kids can choose these books, that'll be good for them. They don't understand the rationales. So getting back to the rationales of teaching. And I think if we've ever developed, and when we've developed a fair amount of curriculum material, we've never developed any curriculum material that didn't begin with knowing the learner and understanding the rationale. Uh, we actually take the time to write that so that teachers have a frame and a context with which to bring what they know about the children to some gentle guidance of what this might sound like or feel like. Uh, and that's all it's meant to be. Our, our respect is for teacher expertise. That is the most important factor. So I've talked a little too long on that. I don't know, Cornelius, if you want to say something or Gay. Well, I just love that so much. I mean, my mind is just savoring that idea of guidance, not scripts, right? That, that when we get handed these resources, that is guidance, that is not like the law, right? And in so many toxic environments, like the two of you have become the law. People are like, well, you got to do your Fountas and Pinnell tonight, or you got to do your Fountas and Pinnell this morning, you know? And, and I just love that idea of guidance. You know, I even think back 
you know, the very first time that I was ever disciplined as a teacher, you know, and again, young teacher, the very first time I ever got in trouble was because I let a kid take a book out of a section that he wasn't supposed to take a book out of. And so, you know, I see this kid and he's like, I want this book. And I'm like, go ahead and go get it. I remember it was Walter Dean Myers. It was, um, it was Scorpions by Walter Dean Myers and he got it and he went and sit in his desk and he's reading it. And then somebody comes in the room and they're like, why is that kid reading that book? He's not supposed to be in that section of the library. And so I got yelled at for allowing a kid to choose a book and they're like you need to tell him that he needs to go to this level and and so what advice do you have for teachers who are in that place like i remember getting yelled at and i and i cried you know again this was my first time getting in trouble in this profession for for doing what i thought was right and doing what i know is right you know i've read your work and so i imagine that even today that was two decades ago but i imagine that even today there are still teachers who haven't committed to reading the script word for word in front of their students, or there are teachers who believe in allowing kids to choose the books that engage and excite them. What words do you have for those people who are in that real like place of tension? Um, the words that stood out to me and what you just said were handed me. <laughs> this is meant to be all we have ever written about are produced is sort of a, we use the word suggested, or you might want to, or this is how we might do it. Here's an example. And that's intended to build the repertoire of the teacher, especially new teachers. And by just giving some examples, um, our intent is that, well, Mari Clay convinced us uh, many years ago of something called economy of language. And it's, it's precise, clear, and not too much of it on the part of the teacher. And sometimes I remember as a young teacher starting out, I just talked it to death. I'd have kids, first graders lying on the floor because I would explained it four different ways with a whole lot of uh, unnecessary um, talk going on on the part of the teacher. And um, this is something I had to learn how to do as a, as a reading recovery teacher was to get out of there and make one clear statement and then get the kids talking. That's where their language comes in, where their learning comes in. So handing someone our materials without some um, wonderful conversations with colleagues, without uh, support from more experienced teachers, you have to know what to do with materials. And my fav two least favorite words in our profession are teacher-proof materials. There's no such thing, nor should we even demean teachers by saying the words. Um, it comes from uh, internalizing many a repertoire of many different ways of interacting with children and being sensitive to giving them space to put things into their words. So they have an opportunity to internalize it. The first question I would ask the child or um, would just say, tell me what you like about that book. Tell me what's interesting to you. What, how, why did you choose it? And they come up with the most surprising things. And so I think individual interactions build understanding in a way that it's person to person not, I'm gonna now read from my script. Um, I recall one school visit, um, this was mm, maybe 12 years ago, 15. Um, it, and the administrator said, I took her around the school and she said to me, now every child is having the exact same experience, which as you know, is not equitable in any way, shape or form. And when I leave the classroom on this grade level of one teacher, I ought to walk in and hear the next teacher finishing the sentence. That's extreme misuse of any kind of suggestion or script. And it, it wasn't a building where they were using our materials. We hadn't even produced them yet. Uh, I, I've got a question. Dick Irene, do you have a, a question for Cornelius? I'm talking too much. No, but I, I just before we kind of leave this topic that is really huge. Um, I just want to make a comment about the interaction you described, Cornelius, because 
what I heard was not an individual, and I'm thinking this individual cares about kids and cares about the school and cares about the teachers, but the individual's response to you was not asking you a question to get behind your teaching decision or your thinking to understand, but rather felt like was operating by rules, not rationales. And I think a lot of what's happening in education is this attempt to standardize practice by getting people to implement programs. Uh, And, you know, Gay and I have said often, we believe that teachers teach children, not programs. And we've certainly referred to any of our work uh, some of which are curriculum materials. Uh, most of them are. Most of our work is professional books, but our curriculum materials as not a program, but a set of resources for teachers to implement in um, ways that reflect their understanding of rationales and their decisions. Because the minute you get into this standardization of practice and get everyone doing the same thing in the same way, you lose the the same book. (laughs) In the same book, you lose the complexity of learning. And if we even just go back to level text, the whole idea was to make these short little books where teachers could choose a particular book instead of read the next book story in the textbook. So that was disbanding textbooks, disbanding every kid reading books in the same sequence, uh, but rather allowing teachers to address the complexity of kids needing more or less, but changing not simply what teachers do. And I think that's where we lose it. We're not about changing what teachers do. Our hope and dream is that we can help teachers shift the way they think about what they do so that they have good rationales for their decisions. That's a big mind shift. You know, we've talked a lot today about um, child-centered instruction and responding to individuals and their uniqueness and their strengths and building on strengths. What do you think is the role of whole group and small group teaching in schools? And I know that might differ middle school versus elementary, but I mean, I think this is a reality for one teacher in a classroom and be really curious about your thoughts. Absolutely. And so like, I think first, like it's important to establish, like when I think whole group and small group, um, I don't necessarily think about it in binary terms. So I don't think either or it's either whole group or it's small group. I don't think in that way, I don't think binaries serve anyone. Um, But I like to think of it as what we typically call whole group. I ask the question, what is the direction that I'm moving the class in? And what do I need to demonstrate for them in terms of literacy so that they continue to move in that direction Mm -hmm. at a steady pace? So Mm -hmm. that's how I determine my lesson. So what's the overall direction that I need to move this class in? Um, And then what do I need to demonstrate for them in a workshop setting, right, so that they can move in that direction. So that direction might be, I need to model for kids how to think critically about character. That's the direction we're moving in. And Mm -hmm. so in order to move in that direction today, I'm going to model for them how to pay specific attention to what a character says and make inferences about who that person is. And so that question, that's what I ask myself. Like, again, what's the overall direction that we're moving in? And then what do I need to model for them today so that we can move into that in that direction? So that kind of dictates kind of what I would call, I guess, my whole group. Right. But here's what happens when you model for kids. The kids have these like ahas or kids have these moments. Right. And so a kid might say, oh, you're talking about how characters talk to one another. My uncle speaks in this way. So now I can make the inference that my uncle must be the kind of person who. And so then I take a quick mental note of that. So when I go talk to this kid later on today individually, this kid's schema for understanding character analysis is going to flow through their understanding of their uncle. And so that's a quick mental note that I might make. And, and, And I might go work with that kid 10 minutes from now during independent reading time. Or another kid might chime in and be like, my uncle's the exact same way. And so is my granddad. 
And so now I'm collecting the data. That's three kids whose schema for understanding character roll, runs through their family. And so what that might communicate to me is like, oh my gosh, this isn't a single kid thing. This might be a small group thing where I can gather these three students who all understand character analysis through the lens of their families and I can help them to work on this. And so that might tell me that this needs to be a small group. Or what might happen is the classroom might completely erupt and now everybody's talking about their family. So now I've lost control of the lesson and everybody's talking about their family. But it's interesting that verb control, that verb control is a really colonial verb. I haven't lost control of the lesson. They have taken the learning for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm like, okay, so now this is a moment where I need to pivot away from talking about character explicitly. And I need to pivot toward talking about how we understand family and then make the very specific connections to character analysis. So when I plan, I don't plan, here's going to be my small group. Here's going to be my like one-on-one -on -one conference. Here's going to be my whole group. I plan, what's the direction I'm going to move kids in? What do I need to model for them? What are kids bringing? How, do, how might I respond? So my plans look like a series of if then statements. It's almost like a computer programmer when you code. Um, it's like, if this happens, then here's a direction that I can move. If this other thing happens, here's a direction I can move. If this thing happens to one kid, then I'll move in that direction in a conference. If this thing happens to three kids, I'll move in that direction in a small group. If this thing is like wildfire, I'll move in that direction whole class. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's, again, I, I'm really teaching myself right now and I'm, I'm growing into this every week. Right. But I'm really teaching myself how to be less realistic in my approach, more impressionistic in my approach. So when we think about art, right, we think impressionist use like dots, right? Like pointillism, right? And so I think about like, all right, here's, you know, small group ish, right? So like, so that kind of thing. Teaching is complex, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one of the beautiful things, again, I work with a team, right? And so there are two other teachers on my hallway specifically who like call me out all the time. They're like, well, Cornelius, like you missed a moment to do this thing. When that kid said this, you could have pivoted in this direction to support them. And so my current like course of study for myself is I'm just learning how to be more nimble in that way. Um, and so what that has meant for me personally, and you two know me, I, I am a very type A personality. I like to plan from point A to point B. I like to have everything organized. And so I've had to let go of a little bit of that so that I can listen more, so that I can respond um, more powerfully. Um, but all of this gets back to what you said early, that I can pivot like this because there are people on my hallway who have ensured that I have the content knowledge. So there are people on my hallway who have ensured that I understand character analysis. There are people on my hallway who have ensured that I understand inference. There are people on my hallway who help me, um, you know, because one of the things that we notice in middle school is that kids are still having some decoding issues, right? And so, so there are people on my hallway who are like Cornelius, even though this is typically the realm of elementary school teachers, you need to learn some of this stuff because it's important for the work that you're doing. And so there are people in my hallway who hold me accountable for building my own content knowledge. Um, and so that's, that's also been an interesting thing to be able to talk publicly in the hallway about here's a thing that I don't know, but my kids need it. So I got to learn it. And, and being able to have the professional like space to say that Mm -hmm. um, and the professional humility to say that has been a really radical act on behalf of our leader, that she's really made the professional space for us to be like, you know what, there are some seventh graders who are still grappling with these like, you know, you know, vowel blends. And so that's not typically our world, but we need to learn that. And here's the space where we can learn that. Our thanks to Irene Gay and Cornelius for their time today. Find Irene and Gay on Twitter at Founders Pinnell, all one word, and you can find Cornelius at Mr. Minor, also all one word. If you would like to see more content from the Heinemann Forward Ed series, check out blog.heinemann.com or visit heinemannpublishing.com slash forward together or the Heinemann Publishing YouTube channel or Facebook page. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. 
And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.